Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Matt Skinner. And me, Joy J. Moore. These are the texts for the 14th Sunday after Pentecost, which falls on August 25, 2024. Our first reading is Joshua 24, 1 through 2a, and then 14 through 18. The semi-continuous Old Testament reading is 1 Kings chapter 8. And you can do 1, 6, 10 through 11, or just 22 to 30, 41 to 43. We continue our reading through Psalm 34, 15 through 22. And we have our last reading from Ephesians chapter 6, 10 through 20. And our last reading of the Bread of Life Discourse, sections of the Bread of Life Discourse, John 6, 56 through 69. And all the preachers said, hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> You stuck with the bread of life this whole summer, all Yay. five. Summers. You've made it. Congratulations! Yes, congratulations. I am going to suggest that you add seventy and seventy-one, <laughs> uh, because why not? As I've said before, but I get why they uh, why the electionary drops that off because ending on we have come to believe and know that you are the holy one of god is most certainly a high note that's for sure uh and the reference to judas in 71 is not the place one would want to end but it's probably truer to well they're there and uh truer to the the challenges and the and the resistances to what Jesus is offering. And it really embodies one of those resistances. And so the pericope here, as you note, backtracks to 56. So it goes back a few verses because again, we're just building, building, building. But uh, the 51 to 58, of course, were these verses about eating my flesh and drinking my blood. And then uh, and then verse 60, when many of his disciples heard it, they said, this teaching is difficult. Who can accept it? And I mentioned last week that, you know, the question is, which teaching is difficult? Uh, and that's, I think that's kind of ambiguous here in that, Jesus has been doing a lot of teaching for the last <laughs> few verses. Does it mean directly um, what was said before, but what part of was what was said before? And I said last week too that the you know the the flesh and the you have these words of of how can this man give us his flesh to eat? But that really high point of the of the discourse, those who eat my uh, eat my flesh and drink my blood, abide in me and I in them. Is that the difficulty? Uh, because it's really, it's really that diff or that promise that, that Judas walks away from. So the betrayal in the gospel of John of Judas is not to hand Jesus over. Jesus does that himself in the garden uh, no one can take my life from me. I take, I give it up of my own accord. John ten, as the good shepherd, uh, Jesus willingly gives himself over, and gives himself up, and so betrayal in this gospel is, is John thirteen, which is also not an electionary, <laughs> and that is uh, Judas in verses chapter thirteen, verses seventeen through thirty walking away from the relationship, leaving the relationship. And so he's leaving the vine. He is leaving. <laughs> he is choosing not to abide in Jesus. And so how is that the difficulty um, in, in terms of in terms of the uh, of the resistances and challenges to what Jesus has said here? And we've pointed to this, thank you for that, Caroline, we've pointed to this over the last few weeks where we've noted the reality of the moment we are living in, that our listeners are living in. And so um, our offering uh, this word uh, needs to be the reality that every one of us can start out making the right choice 
but we risk not enduring to the end. And I think what you've just invited in uh, at least uh, foreshadowing the reality of a betrayal is important for us uh, so that we don't think that we can, um, that everything's just going to be great because we're, we're in the company of Jesus right now. Um, well, that decision made right now uh, needs to be, uh, how do you say it? We need to re-up every single moment. Uh, so, and, and we'll talk about that a little bit when we get to Ephesians today. So I see this passage as, um, and sorry to always compare everything to the synoptics, you know, it's just kind of what I am. Uh, I, I see this as similar to Peter's confession of Jesus as the Messiah and your Caesarea Philippi. In, in Mark 8 and parallels. And not like John has only one of these. There's multiple ones. There's this, there's yeah. the raising of Lazarus and his conversation right. with Mary and Martha, for example. There's Thomas. Um, I'm sure there's more. But it's kind of this moment where Jesus says, kind of lays it out. This is what it's going to look like. This is what I'm about. A lot of people don't like it. And Peter, <laughs> intentionally, by accident, whatever, just comes through with the right thing to say mm -hmm. at this given moment. And so I think to to help people see that, that in a, in a way what this Bread of Life discourse has done is not just spin a bunch of mysteries, but makes a statement finally in, well, not just verse 62, but around yeah. there, of this is who I am. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it might not be the, the, the kind of leader you want. I mean, remember they wanted to make him king by force right. Right. early on in chapter six. Uh, he's going to be the kind of leader who you who you eat uh, or you you know share this intimacy with right and and so there's a sense of disappointment and clarification that are all happening at the same time and the response is we know who you are and we're sticking around for the most mm -hmm. part you know what i mean even though there's a lot of gospel still to go and so i think it's just there's something that a preacher can do with that i think when people are especially if people are wondering like wow bread again uh, the answer is, yeah, bread yeah, again, bread again. How darn it. And here's why, <laughs> because this ends at such an important statement, not just the words Peter says, but the, the wider context in which he says them and helps us reckon with our own ways of having our expectations of Jesus being recalibrated, corrected, reshaped at various times in our own lives. Mm -hmm. Because Jesus is also going to say that we are his friends. And that reality of relationship puts us, um, gives us a responsibility uh, uh, to practice the same kind of generosity of self that Jesus is practicing. I think, too, with adding verses 70 and 71, <laughs> going back and just, I'm not going to make that case till it's, you know, in the ground, but... But it relates back to what you were saying, Matt, with regard to here's Peter's, here's a really remarkable confession from Peter uh, at this point. And yet, um, and yet it is Sam, it's in between <laughs> many of the disciples no longer going with him and the, uh, the foretelling of, of Judas's uh, betrayal. And so in between, you know, and so, so in other words, Judas wasn't the only one who betrayed Jesus, right? right? There, you've got a whole, a whole block of them here who turned back and no longer went about with him. Uh, and then Judas will do the same thing at another critical moment in the, in the gospel of that last night with Jesus. And so it really, and we've talked, I, I know I've talked about this a number of times, but it does go back to, and you were alluding to this, Joy, uh, it puts all of us in this position of, of, of being there, of listening to Jesus' words, and how will we respond? What, what is going to be, uh, or will we, people love darkness rather than the light, going back to John 3.19. And so what, where are the moments that we would walk away? When have we walked away? What are the teachings that are difficult? So it just raises all kinds of of putting people homiletically, perhaps all of us in that place of being the disciples at this point. And what, what are the moments that we, that we find ourselves wishing to walk away? And, uh, and I, I would just make one little uh, correction that helps with this, I think, 
uh, with regard to a translational issue. Verse 60, the NRSV, EU, and NRSV translates it, when many of his disciples heard it, they said, this teaching is difficult. Who can accept it? <laughs> and the word there is not accept. It's again, here, who can hear it? Who can listen? Who can listen to it? And that, that is, that has been a really important uh, theme in the gospel of John gospel. in terms of you know what do people hear when they hear Jesus speak and uh and and everywhere from if you know do whatever he tells you if you hear him life follows for the sake uh with the man who was ill for 38 years go walk, go pick up your mat and he does the man born blind um and even the end of that discourse in 1021 uh the question is why listen to him well because abundance follows, uh, or even in John twenty-one, you know, put your put your nets on the right side of the boat. Oh, and then abundance follows. So that you, a, a preacher, could also tie in that. Why? What do we hear when Jesus says these words? What? Why listen to him? And who can who can who can hear this? It's not accepting it, but yeah. who can hear this? And then follows the voice of the shepherd. Uh, that's that's really that's the underlying. Uh, theme that's it, really important, I think, in this particular passage as well. And I take it all the way back to Mary. Whatever he says, just yeah. do it. Just do it. Do it wherever he tells you. <laughs> Josh, for 24, you ready to say goodbye to John for a few <sighs> months? Well, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, John. Bye. Bye. Christmas is coming. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I think the Joshua text is choose this day whom you will serve. I mean, I think uh, in some ways it's an interesting pairing in that the disciples and really to... everybody in the farewell discourse or the farewell discourse, the bread of life discourse are put in that moment of choice of mm -hmm. will you Will you follow Jesus or will you stick with Jesus or not? Um, so I think I, that's what I'm assuming is the, the rationale connection. behind the job. Mm -hmm. You might have some other connections that I didn't see. There's also, uh, you know, in adding a verse uh, that you did with John, where we, where we add verse uh, 70 and um, uh, 71, uh, there's also this recognition of this is the transition uh, this is the end of jo Joshua. This is Joshua laying before them what has been and saying, okay, get ready for what's going to come next. And uh, there's a consistency. Um, not everybody was able to hear that word of Jesus to be ready for what was coming next. And there's another similarity that can be made if we pay attention to that larger uh, uh, narrative of what happened with the people of Israel when they followed the words of Joshua. Uh, who was following the words of God and when they did not. I'm holding on to your hearing who can hear this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I just did want to point out, um, yeah, I mean, it is kind of this, why would we want to serve another God, you know, given who you are? I, I would just point out what's probably obvious to a lot of preachers is uh, the final verses here are difficult to hear given the events of the last year and, and any any text about land and about conquest. Yeah. Is um, is tough because people hear things and they often kind of make easy equivalencies to contemporary problems. And a preacher's response, I think, is to acknowledge that, but also to acknowledge how issues of land and promise are way more complicated than a single sermon is going to be able to encapsulate. So just to kind of note that, but. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. This is a tough text to discover on a Monday morning that you're going to have to like say something about mm -hmm. uh, on Sunday. Uh, mm -hmm. I appreciate yeah. that, Matt, Matt, because if if we don't recognize that this is tough, that this should not be read lightly, um, we can miss what's behind the text. The readings of Joshua and the readings of Judges are very different because in Joshua, there is this level of the difference between when the people were obedient 
And God did what was necessary to give them the land. And when the people took the attitude of victory and did it themselves, and that's the way we read the text today, is we want to celebrate what God has done and do it ourselves. And if um, you pay attention to the difference between what's happening in Joshua and what's happening in Judges, um, and, and I'm saying this because this is a scary thing to realize on Monday morning. Oh, my goodness, I need Joshua. I need Joshua in context. And so we spent a lot of time putting the, um, uh, the Bread of Life discourse in context. We need to read these texts about taking the land in context. And so when you read through the book of Judges, that's where all of Judges, after Judges chapter 1, all of Judges is... After the spirit of the Lord or the angel of the Lord has come and said, you guys didn't do what I asked you to do. I'm not on your side here. That's a different way of following what we have in this verse right here in Joshua, where it is you choose. Are you going to follow the Lord? That's what I'm going to do or not. And when the people choose not to follow the Lord, they try to imitate what God has promised, and that is we steal the land from someone else. That's not something we can do if it's Friday night when you're listening to this podcast and you got a couple of hours to write a, a sermon uh, it, to really be faithful to Joshua. Don't listen on Friday. No. <laughs> we are, if we it's are, Friday, we're a Monday hello, morning everybody. Podcast. Hello, everybody. If it's Friday, podcast. don't do Joshua. <laughs> Unless you started reading it three years ago. Hey, if we were a Friday afternoon podcast, we'd have a lot better ideas, don't you think? Probably. We're yeah. kind of a Monday of morning. Hey, maybe it's yeah. This. yeah. This is hard. <laughs> the Psalm. There it is. More Psalm thirty-four. Uh, I just, I mean, I think you could again, once again, you can pick out some of the language here of depending on, depending on which direction your sermon is uh, going. You know, the Lord redeems the life of, of the Lord's servants and of those who take refuge in the Lord will be condemned. There's refuge and and why, you know, why choose the Lord? Because this is this is because the Lord listens to you. And uh, so that's the way I would use the song. I think that, you know, the the uh, Joshua is the end of a very long story uh, in mm -hmm. the in the hexateuch there. And it's it's it, it, it is. Ref I mean, the, the perspective, at least, is refuge. Uh, John six, there was a sense of, of refuge there as well. And, uh, Jim Mead even points out in the commentary on this Psalm, mm -hmm. you're going to have conflict in Ephesians six as well. And so some of that, that language of protection for vulnerable or imperiled people mm -hmm. is, uh, that's what the Psalms are. So that's when the Psalms are their best. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And to bring on my, my, my continuity, it's, uh, to turn, uh, uh, I'm paying attention to verse 21 to remember that evil, even when it's done by people who claim they are doing in the name of God, evil brings death to the wicked and those who hate the righteous will be condemned. The consequences that we've seen back in the life of David, that we've seen throughout the unfaithfulness of the people of God, that we see even today, evil, even when it's done in the name of God, brings death. And um, it's, it, it is God who is the source of our refuge. And uh, I just want to be aware of that reality in, you know, as we, as we preach in the 21st century moment that we live in. All right. First Kings, got Solomon, temple. Temple's been built. We should probably note that. <laughs> a, little, a little something's happening, happened in the, in the interim well, something here. Happened before we got to chapter eight. Oh yeah, we built the temple. Uh, and so what we get, of course, in these in these verses is the uh, is the dedication of the temple, the procession of the ark, the dedication uh, and then feasting around. But we don't get that part in the in the lectionary, but lectionary, a big feast dedicating the temple. So that's uh, but the temple has already happened just to. Yeah, it's exactly. it's worth noting that, you know, from the beginning of the story of the temple, there's an acknowledgement that the temple itself can't contain God's glory, which yes. puts a damper on some Christian mischaracterization of first century Judaism in Jesus's day. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, but just to note that that's always been part of it. But also, again, at the very end of this prayer, the the imagination is that the temple is going to benefit the whole world. That the benefit that uh, anybody who prays toward this place um, can be heard by God. So yes, mm-hmm. for all of the kind of royal dynastic stuff, you know, the way that this is kind of a religious legitimation of David's dynasty and Solomon's place in it leave that aside and kind of talk about this idea of, of a, um, the places we build, the places we go to, to honor God should be bigger than just ourselves should serve more than just our own vision. And, Mm -hmm. you know, um, a lot of people have big questions about interreligious dialogue and what does my Christian faith mean for my spouse or my relative or whomever who believes something else and to think about the ways in which God promises to, to bless the whole world. Yeah, I really like that. Yeah. yeah. And that, that comes out of uh, the integrity uh, of, of the one who is, uh, who says that they are following in the name of Christ. Uh, it's not a, a compromise, it's the integrity. And so when a person is seeking God, if all we can do is to point a finger of judgment, they're going to miss the faithful refuge of the God we say that we have put our trust in. And that that's 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 a more inviting way to have this conversation than one of judgment. It it sticks with this idea of God being the refuge, God being the source. Yeah, and I think if I were preaching on this passage, I go I would go right to verse 27 uh that you mentioned already, Matt, but even heaven and the highest heaven Heaven and the highest heaven <laughs> cannot contain you, contain you, much less this much house. Less this house. And the way that could be an entire refrain for how we think about church and 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 our sanctuaries and what they're what they're used for, and uh, and uh, particularly contexts and situations where uh, where that has been a huge conversation issue with regard to, you know, what, what is the church? What is this space? What is this, what is this building, uh, that we're, that we worship in? What is it, what is it good for? Uh, and, uh, and how much have we tried to contain God? I mean, just all kinds of really important questions, I think, particularly, particularly post pandemic, which we've talked about before, but also as, uh, as churches are facing, um, closures and things that what, what will that, how, how does this, how does this question then get talked about theologically? And I think Solomon offers a, a, a really important lens into that. This, this text and, and this, this idea of, you know, we're reading this in the breakup of the lectionary, we're reading this in the practices of Solomon's wisdom. That's what we read last week. You know, give me the wisdom to 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 um, uh, be able to lead my people well. Uh, it's not just in this temple. In fact, this is before that temple's built, and so outside of the space that we've set aside, quote unquote, for God to abide. If we abide in Him, when we leave that space, then God is not restrained to that space, but God actually leaves that space with us. Um, I like to talk about the gathering of the people when we enter into the sanctuary, uh, the space where we worship together, and then the scattering of the people where we live in this hope 24-7, Monday through Saturday. And this is a, a text that invites us to do that not just where we are trying to contain God in this little building, but that we are in this space experiencing God so that we can, um, um, what's the word that we've been talking about when we were in John? Can I say that? Abiding with him when we leave this space. All right. Uh, Last Ephesians. Bye, Ephesians. Gosh, we have to say goodbye to a lot of things. Yes, yeah, we're coming to the end. Too, including summer. By First Kings, by summer, by Ephesians, by John. Yeah. 
Oh, hey, we are going to, we're jumping to Song of Solomon next week. So we kind of go from the temple to that. That's going to be a bit of a, <laughs> a whiplash for some folks. Yeah. yeah. But we've also skipped over a rather notorious part of Ephesians, which is probably okay, but Ugh. a passage people know is there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I would just, I don't, it depends. It always depends on, you know, what you're, what you're, what you need to do in your context. Uh, but if anybody is, I mean, if you're working through Ephesians and, you know, and you're encouraging people to read Ephesians, uh, I would imagine yeah. that there'd be you who would come back and say, why don't we preach on that? You know, Definitely. why don't we talk about that in church? <laughs> and of course we're meet, we mean the household codes and uh, 521 and, and so forth. So, it, it's an extraordinarily uh, uh, difficult and um, uh, troubling, problematic passage, the way it's been used and the uh, way it's been interpreted. And so I would either, as a preacher, anticipate that or somehow in, uh, get it in there <laughs> that, uh, that, that you are saying some words about it and to remember that often, I talked about this with my students frequently, that not often, but sometimes preaching has to offer a corrective to harmful mis misreadings of texts that, uh, that have gotten a life of their own, uh, grown a life of their own within our, within our common uh, reality. And so, yeah. But... That's, yeah. But then we have this passage, putting on the armor of God. I, I just, just to echo uh, or underscore what you're saying, Caroline, I do think it's very important for us to not allow the fact that this isn't a part of a lectionary uh, for it to be ignored um, uh, uh, as if it's not there or if it, as if it doesn't have significance. Um, but as you said, uh, there are times, depending on where your congregation is and what your community needs at this time, that you may have to do that corrective teaching. Amen to all of that. But Ephesians yeah. six. <laughs> yeah, go ahead, Matt. Oh, I mentioned last week when I teach Ephesians, people talk about they remember Sunday school classes where they dressed up in armor, and um, <laughs> so it's just it, 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 the passage is vivid. It can be fun to teach to kids in that way. You know, it recalls Isaiah 59. It's, uh, but a lot of people have had their their vision of church shaped by this in militaristic ways, in ways mm -hmm. that are dangerous and threat that make them feel like life is dangerous and threatening. And so just to <laughs> acknowledge some of that and take apart some of what it's talking about here in terms of these things that are meant as, as protection uh, you might want to talk to somebody in your congregation who is or has been a soldier in modern warfare because they wear a lot of armor uh, these yes. days and yeah. to talk about the psychology of that and what it means to have the the illusion of protection. <laughs> I mean, protection from some things, but mm -hmm. uh, you know, a lot of our defensive mechanisms in society are more about creating a sense of, of false assurance uh, right, there are weapons that are stronger than any armor. I mean, there's just things to do that 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 acknowledge the ways in which some of this language and imagery is important to be heard, but uh, might need some correction again to use that word. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So often, in the corrective nature of this, so often when we read this, we spend, or what, I, I know in ways that I've been taught it, uh, I, I remember we were focusing so much on the metaphor that we actually paid attention to the armor as opposed to what the context of this, which simply is be strong in the Lord and in the strength of God's power. And when you start with that context to make it back about our strength is in the Lord, you begin to read almost the absurdity that, you know, a sword being the word, you know, um, our, 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 uh, what's protecting our feet is peace. There's actually, this is counterintuitive. So, uh, Matt, when you were saying about to talk to a soldier and look at what uh, that illusion of protection is, we have made this too much of an illustration um, where we've picking, picked up the might of the metaphor and not picked up the trust. 
uh, the complete reliance and uh, dependence on God. And, and, and I would uh, invite our, our preachers to play with that idea, uh, flipping this uh, very militaristic idea uh, to uh, a confidence that truly is trusting in God. That, that maybe that maybe maybe our uh, retired military can hear while also uh, having pacifists in the audience. And I, I would say the the trust, but also the the entirety. I mean, I think that's that's the or the the full coverage yes. <laughs> of of the power of God that we that we have. Uh, because you get, I think it's so interesting that you have. You know, basically, it's narrated as as a soldier would put on each piece mm-hmm. of this armor yes. and nothing is left uh, exposed. And so you, you start with the, you know, or belt around your waist, breastplate, shoes, uh, the shield, and then um, the helmet. Right. And so, uh, and so there's, there's an entirety of it. Right. That, uh, that also I think is communicated in the, in the metaphor, in the imagery that also might uh, ring with good news for the listener. Sermon Brainwave is a production of Luther Seminary's Working Preacher. Working Preacher has been a trusted source of inspiration, interpretation, and imagination for preachers worldwide since 2007. Find episodes and links at workingpreacher.org slash brainwave, and be sure to rate, subscribe, and comment on YouTube. Thanks for joining us.